tonight on KQED Newsroom, as Governor Jerry Brown prepares to leave office, we talk with him about his life, legacy, and his hopes for California's future. Plus, from a midterm election that altered the nation's power balance to troubling revelations about big tech, a look back at some of the top stories of 2018. And comedian Paula Poundstone on politics, podcasts, and performing without a script. We'll hear how she got her start in stand-up right here in San Francisco. Hello and welcome to KQED Newsroom. I'm Tui Vu. We begin with Governor Jerry Brown's farewell. He's leaving office January 7th, handing off the baton to Governor-elect Gavin Newsom. During his tenure, he reversed the state's fiscal woes and is now leaving it with a projected budget surplus of $30 billion. He oversaw a broad overhaul of the state's criminal justice system and fought for policies to combat climate change amid multiple challenges from the Trump administration. KQED's politics and government senior editor Scott Schaefer sat down with Brown at the governor's mansion. Governor Brown, thanks yeah. for joining us on KQED. How are you feeling, your final days in office? Feel good. It's very engrossing. There's a lot to do. So we, we have some regulatory uh, issues. Uh, we've got some lawsuits. We have personnel questions. So um, I got plenty to do over the next uh, almost three weeks. You came into office and it was a mess, mm -hmm. right? So there were questions about whether California was even governable. There was a $26 billion deficit, a big recession. And there's an expression, never let a good crisis go to waste. Yeah. And I'm wondering, do you feel like you used that crisis to do things that you might not have otherwise been able to do? Well, we got things. So without the, that fiscal crisis, we probably wouldn't have had the rainy day fund. Uh, we wouldn't have the cuts that we, we made. And we might not have had the uh, tax increase that Proposition 30 was. So those were all things that responded to a clear problem that presented real threats. But that's what government is. It's challenge and response. Uh, that, you get a challenge, and you got to respond. And there was no challenge, we'd all be asleep. There'd be nothing to do. Uh, but that was a particularly difficult period. Uh, millions of people lost their homes, uh, millions, millions of people lost their jobs. That was a very unusual period, and it did provide the stimulus for a lot of things we did later. To what extent were there things that you did because you felt you had to, but you didn't necessarily want to? And one thing that I'm thinking of is getting rid of the redevelopment agencies. And maybe you wanted to do that, I don't know, but were there things that you would have liked not to do in terms of big cuts well, I, like that? Uh, redevelopment is siphoned money from the schools. And the schools uh, needed money. And many people think they still need money. Teachers not uh, overly paid in any sense. The redevelopment, there were plenty of abuses. A lot of people wanted to see it go. And it did free up almost $2 billion a year for schools. And if people want to bring it back, they're going to take billions from the schools. And I would assume those people who care about the California public schools will fight that very hard. Yeah. You um, have made, among other things, criminal justice reform really one of the hallmarks of your eight years in office. And part of that was due to the federal courts saying yeah. you've got to reduce the prison population. But there was, you went well beyond, I think, what needed to be done to do that, to accomplish that. And I'm wondering, like, why was that such a signature important issue for you? Oh, well, first of all, because there's so damn many people locked up. Uh, a couple of years before I became governor, there were over 170,000 uh, principally men, principally low-income men of color, and not all that well-educated for the most part, all locked up in cages. Uh, some people call it the gulag, Western style. Now, go back a few decades, and there were 20, 25,000, 28,000 uh, locked up. We had 12 prisons. Now we all of a sudden went on a, a, a prison building binge, which I'm sure the legislature didn't really think through, and we go up to 35 prisons. So uh, yet the number of felonies isn't that much different from the 70s. So why would you more than double your prisons and more than quadruple the number of inmates? So that tells me we need to reform. Um, yes, they're very dangerous people. Uh, horror, horrible things have been done. but. Uh, Human beings are capable of transformation, are capable of change. And we want to make that change uh, more likely by having the right kind of environment in prisons, in jails, in alternative programs, and having a sentencing policy that makes sense. Another big issue, of course, for you is the environment and climate change. Uh, do you feel like you accomplished everything you wanted to do as governor on that issue, or were there things undone? 
California has taken more intelligent action on climate change than any uh, state or province in the Western Hemisphere, and more than almost all uh, jurisdictions in the whole world. So we've done a lot. Is it enough to stop climate change? No. Uh, the world has to do much more, much quicker, and so does California. Uh, but that stepping it up requires public support. And as we see with uh, Macron, riots in the streets because of a carbon tax. We see in Washington, a uh, carbon tax was handily defeated. So no, I'm not satisfied at all. We're on the road to disaster. We're going to get more drought, more fires, uh, more destruction, and we better start controlling it. You uh, are California's youngest governor, and you're California's oldest governor. I think there were about, what, 30-something years or so, 30 or so years in between. Well, just by point of accuracy, we did have some younger governors uh, in the 19th century. But in the 20th century, I'm the youngest yeah. and the oldest, by f oldest of all time. Yeah. Uh, and so you had a lot of experiences yeah. in your life in between those two terms, yeah. you know, and I won't go through them all, but you were, there were some public offices you held, you yeah. did the Buddhist thing, yeah. the Zen monastery. Like, how do you think all those things in between the two times you were governor made you different as governor? Well, the we are time? different. You know, we, 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 as you age, you get new things look different. You can look back on your life and you learn things, hopefully. Um, I've learned to work very closely with the legislature, but again, it's easier to work with them when I'm older than most of them and I have more experience. The first time around, I was younger and I had less experience and a lot of what they were doing was all new to me. Whereas now, most of what we're doing uh, is familiar to me and new to them. So that's allowed a more balanced relationship, which uh, I don't think I've taken advantage of, but I've fully embraced uh, to make a cooperative partnership. So uh, January 7th, you and your wife, Anne, are going to leave. You're going to go to Calusa yeah. County, uh, which is a much quieter existence right. than you've been used to. What are you going to miss, do you think, if anything? Uh, I'm not sure. When I left the last time, I didn't miss too much. I mean, I, when I left, I don't think I looked back. What was Duke Magian doing? He was the governor after me. Or uh, what was the legislature doing? Um, you go on about your life. Uh, on January 24th, I'll be in Washington to unveil the clock that is put out by the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, and they will tell us how close to midnight are we on the doomsday clock, which means how close are we to the end of the world. Now, that's important. That's important work to try to wake people up. And I hope to meet with uh, members of the Senate and the House and get a greater awareness that we've got to deal with the nuclear threat. And then I'm also going to be working on, on climate issues and then uh, probably prison reform and sentencing. So just those three things alone, not to mention uh, my olive trees and uh, making sure that the uh, emitters aren't plugged up or eaten by squirrels. Uh, I've got a lot to do. All right, Governor Brown, thank you so much. And we okay. hope you have a long retirement, long next chapter, I guess. That's I probably am... a better way to say it. Good. Well, yeah, I don't think of retirement. I think of taking off in a new direction. Now, a look back at 2018. In politics, California played a key role in the midterm election's blue wave. Democrats won congressional seats long held by Republicans in central and southern California. At the state capitol, the Me Too movement and sexual harassment allegations forced lawmakers to resign. Meanwhile, refugees became the focus of a bitter political debate as the Trump administration separated families and civil rights advocates went to court. And in the tech industry, a moment of reckoning amid rising anger over how companies like Facebook, Google, and Twitter handle user data and fail to guard consumer privacy. Here now with a year-end review of these and other top stories are three KQED reporters. From our politics and government desk, Marisa Lagos, co-host of the California Report, Lily Jamali, and KQED Silicon Valley Bureau Chief, Tanya Mosley. Nice to have all of you here. Thanks, Thanks for, for having, having us. You. A big year for immigration. Uh, just today, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that the Trump administration's ban on asylum for any immigrants who cross the U.S.-Mexico border illegally, um, they ruled against it. Marisa, what happens now, especially since the Trump administration just really announced this week that immigrants seeking asylum would have to wait in Mexico? for their court rulings. Yeah, well, I think like everything that's happened, quite frankly, over the last two years, this throws more confusion in some areas and maybe clarifies a little bit. You know, this was basically the Trump administration attempting to kind of rewrite laws that Congress had written pretty clearly, which said, 
no matter how you cross the border, whether it's at a port of entry or illegally, you may apply for asylum. Um, the court upheld a lower court's decision, you know, saying that Congress really did spell that out in the statute. Interestingly, John Roberts um, did, the Chief Justice, did side with the more liberal justices. And I think that now you're going to see um, probably more, even more people applying for asylum, maybe people who had been a little deterred by some of this back and forth. Um, but really, you know, what I think the Mexican government is scrambling to figure out, what the new mm -hmm. policy means. Um, in terms of people waiting in line in Mexico. Um, and I think really for everyone, it's just been, so, you know, just so many changes so quickly. And, you know, I mean, Lily, you've been down there. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of uh, frustration, frankly, on the Mexican uh, side of the border, um, both uh, probably with refugees or migrants who are waiting to come in, uh, but also from the government. I spoke with the, someone at the Mexican embassy in Washington yesterday after that, um, decision to keep folks on the Mexican side while they go through the asylum process. Um, it's been reported as a deal that the U.S. and Mexico struck, but when I spoke to them, it was quite clear they were told by the Trump administration at 8 o'clock yesterday morning that this was happening. It was not a deal that was hatched by both sides. And from we've what seen I can this tell. before, right? I mean, the travel ban announced with very little notice, um, other immigration policies announced with very little notice. For immigrants, how confusing is this? They're, you know, court ruling after court ruling, policy yeah. after policy. Well, you know, I don't think that they are checking every tit for tat, um, you know, thing that happens uh, on this issue, on an issue that's very important to them. Uh, they're not checking Twitter every second the way a lot of reporters who follow this, uh, this beat closely are. Um, and so I think what we're seeing is they are still going to the border and there are actually lawyers uh, in some cases trying to receive them and telling them, don't leave. You know, if you're going to a border where um, we're hearing in Otay Mesa, for example, that they are being rerouted to another border entry in San Diego at San Ysidro, those lawyers are there to re receive them and say, don't go anywhere. Um, and so, you know, there is some support for them in that regard, but there's a lot of, there's really a deluge of news. And I think the most that they can do is just understand that this is really uh, an asylum policy that is under assault by the Trump administration. I think most of them get that. Well, also under assault are not only people currently seeking asylum, but the Trump administration now uh, is trying to also target Vietnamese refugees for deportation. People who have been here for decades uh, in the Silicon Valley, where you are, where your base of coverage is. How is that playing out? Well, it's a huge issue. When we talk about Silicon Valley, San Jose proper, and Santa Clara County, we're talking nearly 200,000 residents who live there and who are Vietnamese. And we're talking about generations of folks. The um, migration started happening in the 70s and the 80s. This is a huge community, and they're really watching it very closely and very concerned about the impact overall. And I think politically, it's a really, when I, I remember when, the, when this broke, I, I thought it was such a bizarre move for the Trump administration to make, because in California, at least, first generation Vietnamese have been a very loyal voting bloc for Republicans historically. Especially in Orange County. Especially in Orange County, where we just saw all of the congressional Republicans lose. And so it just seems, I mean, and you have already seen generational changes. I think kids of those um, immigrants are more likely to be independent or democratic anyway. But I, I do think that this is just one of those things where you're you're going, okay, you, you're attacking everybody, including people that are part of your base, and how is that gonna play out in 2020? I mean, it, it seems to me like it could be a bad miscalculation. All right, a, a bit of a head scratcher there. Yeah. Let's talk about tech as well, Tanya. What a uh, year. Right? What a year. <laughs> For, for a lot of companies, but particularly for Facebook and its users. What are we learning now about which companies Facebook shared data with and, and how many users were affected? The New York Times has been doing some amazing investigations right. of this. We learn about new companies every single day, it seems. I count it from February to today, we've had 21 scandals over the course of this time. Involving Facebook. Inv involving Facebook and user data. And so right now, we're just learning more and more about the policies, the way Facebook works. I think that it was a huge awakening for nor regular people who aren't reporters to actually learn the inner workings of Facebook and how Facebook works, that they actually 
receive money through advertising and through our data and through metadata. And so that's something that many people are now learning and we're learning about more and more companies. You talked about the New York Times and their investigations, their reporting. We're now learning that many companies, including Apple and Spotify and Netflix. Microsoft, Microsoft Amazon. That's right. They received access to our data and they were actually in proxy. So it's a very confusing type of way that they worked, but essentially they were working under Facebook's arm. So they actually were thought of as part of Facebook when they received our data. And you know, earlier this year, the state legislature did pass a privacy law for California because the FCC has really refused to take this up in the way that some folks would like them to in terms of protecting consumers. And that is going into effect uh, in January. The attorney general is going to be holding these hearings around the state to try to get um, consumer input on what they think those privacy regulations should look like. Um, so I would expect to see more on this from the California legislature next year because I think that there's going to be some problems with that law they're going to have to work out. They are. They'll be spending the next Next year working that out. It will look very different from what uh, became an act in August. And what about at the federal uh, level, though? Because we have now a number of congressional uh, lawmakers who are very concerned. I mean, Senator Richard Blumenthal of Connecticut compared Facebook's data privacy problems to the BP oil spill, and he tweeted this out. He said, it's ongoing, uncontained, and toxic. We will be paying the price for decades. How likely are we going to see tighter regulation of tech companies in 2019? That's the big question, but there are several open investigations on the federal level that we'll be following into January and February. So we'll see where this shakes out, but I think that we will see uh, more push for there to be regulations over time. Okay. And we had the the other major story this year, and it's just so, so horrible, the campfire. It was just such so much devastation, um, the deadliest and most destructive wildfire in California history. Uh, Lily, how are the survivors of this fire coping? So it's been just over a month now since that fire ignited, and I think that, you know, emergency mode is now over. Uh, people have caught their breath and you see a lot of people in the Butte County uh, complex doing things like uh, trying to get their properties reassessed, um, taking care of their property taxes and trying to get them lowered. And, you know, that all uh, all along, they're also trying to take care of their personal lives. A lot of them have kids and they're trying to make sure that their kids are okay and understanding what is going mm -hmm. on. So um, I think it's really, it's really that moment where we're kind of going to see what this community looks like. Are people going to stay? I know a lot of people have already thought about leaving or have. Um, and so I think what happens in the coming weeks and certainly in the, in the first part of this year is really going to dictate um, how this story looks, you know, two, three years from now, yeah. 10 years from now, are people going to uh, to bail on, on Paradise, on Butte County, or are they gonna plant roots again and make it work? And what can we expect to see from Mayor-elect Gavin Newsom on this issue? And from PG&E, yeah. it's under a lot of investigations. That is the, what, $15 billion question, yeah. I think is the, I mean, you know, I think that this is an issue that the new governor is going to have to tackle no matter what. Um, I've heard some speculation he could call a special session to look at not just PG&E and utility liability, but the sort of broader question of fire prevention and, and really living with fire, because I think that's something California has to grapple with, with climate change, with drought, with the way we've built into these communities that that really do butt up against these rural areas, we're not, this isn't going away. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I don't think it's the first thing that Newsom wanted to do. Um, and I think that he's gonna be under a microscope when it comes to his relationship with pg &E, which is of course headquartered in San Francisco. And you know, the executives there do have a long relationship with him. And, and I made a mistake earlier. I've referred to Gavin Newsom as mayor elect. <laughs> I do know yeah. that he is, he was mayor of San Francisco. I do know that he is now no, going no, to be no. our governor. I, I was just gonna add to that though. You know, it's crises like the that can really make or break uh, a politician. And mm -hmm. um, and Gavin Newsom, I think, you know, he has a lot of things that he would like to have be his signature issue. Um, climate change, of course, was a big one for his predecessor. I was thinking perhaps immigration uh, might be one for Gavin Newsom. He's been uh, stressing early childhood education mm -hmm. as well. That's a big one for Ch him. Healthcare, but, yes. But my point is, this might be the thing that defines how we view him uh, when the history books are written. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And I think that it is, it is, it's a challenge because there are so many 
many different um, groups that you are going to have to be sort of waiting between when it comes to, you know, the, the insurance industry, the homeowners, the local governments. Um, and I think it's going to take a lot of leadership to step back and talk about ways that, you know, the state can really step in and make sure that we're not building, just, just sort of making the same mistake over and over again. And I think that's a really tough one, maybe even tougher than the utility question, right. because we like local control in California. And let's talk real quickly about the midterm election, because we had the blue wave, but as part of that, we also had a pink wave. And how has that affected California? Well, you know, we have now three of the state's seven constitutional offices, uh, statewide offices held by women. We have, I think, um, a, a, an uptick in women in the legislature, not still not complete sort of parity between men and women. But I think that there's a lot of excitement, and I think you're going to see some of that Me Too legislation that came out last yeah. year, continued push. We do have a leader of the state Senate who's a woman, and uh, Gavin Newsom's new chief of staff as well. And real quickly, 20 seconds, uh, the pink wave also kind of extended to, to tech, right? We had the Google walkout on That's sexual right. misconduct concerns. That's right. And it really showed for, for the community at large and for women that they have the power. They made a Google essentially undo forced arbitration for women and so mm -hmm. in sexual harassment cases so it shows that when communities galvanize when they get together employees 20,000 walked out they can force they, change they made a statement all right we we sort of have our own little pink wave here with our all I women know, <laughs> Tanya yeah. Mosley Lily Jamali and Marisa Lagos thank you all thank you yeah. Let's switch gears now to something lighter. Paula Poundstone is a star panelist on the NPR quiz show, Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, where she's known for her off-the-cuff humor. Last year, she published another book, The Totally Unscientific Study of the Search for Human Happiness. She's had an HBO special, her own TV variety show, and she's on her second podcast called Nobody Listens to Paula Poundstone. She refined her stand-up act here in San Francisco at tiny clubs and open mic nights in the 1980s. Paula joins us now to reflect on her career and wrap up a wild year with us. Paula, nice to have you here. Thanks so much for having me. It's nice to be here. Welcome back in, to San Francisco. In cold, raw San Francisco. <laughs> I've been shivering since I've been here. Uh, well, you know, now that you're back, you were here in the 1980s. You did a lot of stand-up comedy here. You pretty much started your career here. How does the city seem now to you coming back? Well, you know, what everybody tells me is that it's really expensive to live here now. Oh, yeah. Yeah, which oh, is, yeah. Uh, that's probably not a good idea on the part of Sam. See, I was, I, I was just saying to somebody today, you know, the reason we could have such a creative, energetic stand-up comedy scene with a lot of people coming to town just to learn to do this job um, it's because you could live here cheaply. Yeah, well, not anymore. Not anymore. Not yeah. anymore. But I mean, I, it's going to hurt the arts at a, at, yeah. at, a, at a certain point, even though I'm sure there'll be a lot of good. I bet you have a lot of stores here that sell high end kitchen things. Do you, do you <laughs> yeah, have that? Well, we have, we have stores that sell all kinds of high end things, not just kitchen things. I just picture <laughs> San Francisco now being a place. I mean, I think I owned one saucepan when I lived here. But I, I picture it now being a place where everyone has a, ki a kitchen just full yeah. of things that you, you use just for one specific task in the kitchen. Are you a cook? No. But I have a kitchen full of things for one specific task. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I just... But you know, I, I, I was looking back at some of your old performances here in San Francisco, and that you were here in the heyday of comedy in the Bay Area. Oh, it was fun. What, what are some of your fondest memories from that time? Well, you know, we, there was a bunch of us that went uh, from uh, that went from club to club uh, on open mic nights together because nobody, only one or two people had cars of yeah. that, you know, uh, and, and on a Monday night, you could do three open mic nights, as I recall. There's a place called the Holy City Zoo. Yeah. Uh, back then, uh, there was the other cafe, and, and, uh, and there were, well, the punchline, the punchline's still there, isn't it? And there was another place called Cobb's Pub. Yeah. I know Cobb's is Cobb's still there. Cobb's is still there. Yeah. And I think yeah. the punchline's still and, there. And Robin Williams became your friend during that time. Yeah, yeah. Robin was from here. He wasn't the same uh, graduating class of stand-up comic that I was. Yeah. He was already a big, huge star by the time that I showed up. But he was uh, very, um, what's the word, uh, paternal, I think, to lots of comics. He was a very generous man. Well, fast forward, you're now, you know, on the NPR News Quiz program, Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, very popular. Uh, how do you prepare for something like that? Do, you, do they tell you the topics in advance? No. We know, we know the questions are going to, it's a weekly news quiz show. Yeah. And so we know the questions are going to be about the week's 
news. I, I use a fairly unusual and wasteful method and not really successful method of preparing for the show. I hold the record for losses on <laughs> wait, wait, don't tell me. Um, and people ask me all the time, they go, are you, they, people ask me if I purposely throw the matches. And, in, and the answer to that is no, I'm trying to win. Do you think the other contestants cheat? Yes. No one ever talks about the doping, but it's there. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm trying really hard to win. I, I read the, uh, or I skim anyway, mm -hmm. a week's worth of, and don't tell this to anybody, but New York Posts. I get the New York That's your big news source. Post. Be, here's why I get it. So it has a major news story, it's just not well told. Um, and then it also has news of the weird. And that's what kills you on Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. Well, well okay, since you're Is very... Is the news of the weird. Well... Well, you know, there's a lot of weirdness now, even the stuff that's not meant to be weird, right? I mean, talk yeah. about the, the you, government shutdown that was and wasn't, but now may be no, again. Might, what do you think be, about that? Yeah, uh, it's, it's horrifying. The whole thing is horrifying. I, 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 every day I try to figure out why, how do we get here, what happened. As near as I can tell, electing Trump is to Americans what beaching themselves is to whales. We, there is, scientists don't understand it. <laughs> there appears to be. The only difference is we don't have another species to shove us back in the water. You're changing with the times. You're now doing podcasts. There's a lot of, there are a lot of podcasts out there. There are tons I of know. podcasts. So how challenging is it to come up with something different? Well, it's not easy at all because uh, one, you know, one, at this point, the things that human beings have in common are that we breathe oxygen, we don't eat our young, and we have a podcast. So it is very difficult to, <laughs> to sort of stand out in that crowd. But um, nobody listens to Paula Poundstone. It's just plain fun. That's what it is. It's me and my partner, Adam Felber, and uh, we, we, we call it a comedy advice podcast. Its number one job is to be funny, but we bring on people that are experts on different topics. And, yeah. and uh, topics that, uh, like, we had... A, we had a lady come talk about uh, house mold, and, and frankly, it was very helpful. So even if you go away and you didn't find it hysterically funny, which I hope that you will, but um, you at least come away with some good, solid information about house mold, and we, we try to make sure that we at least deliver information. Okay. Paula Poundstone, thanks for being with us. I know that you're back in the Bay Area on December 31st. You'll be performing at 8 p.m. at the Norse Theater. It's now renamed Sydney Goldstein Theater. That's right. But New Year's at the Sydney Goldstein. Exactly. Yeah. What it's, better way to spend New Year's Eve? It's the best way. It's the healthiest thing in the world. And l laughing out the old year and laughing in the New Year is a great thing to do. I like that a lot. Paula Poundstone, nice to have you with us. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. And that will do it for us. Tune in next week for our show about the arts in the Bay Area. Then our special Stand Up San Quentin the following week. We'll return on January 11th with our regular program. As always, you can find more of our coverage at kqed.org slash newsroom. I'm Twee Boo. Have a wonderful holiday season, and thank you for joining us.